welcome to the deep dive. This time, we're turning the clock back to 1983, diving into performance-based job aids and training with uh, Donald H. Bullock's The Training Consultants Memo. A real blast from the past. Totally. Think of this deep dive as like a crash course yeah. in, you know, spotting those performance hiccups and figuring out when you need job aids, when you need training, all that good stuff. You know, it's actually fascinating to peek back at the training practices of another era. Bullock, who, by the way, was knee deep in it at the Chesapeake and Potomac Telephone Company's training and development department, structures his whole book as this self-instructional dialogue. Oh, wow. Yeah, complete with multiple choice questions and everything. It's like those old programmed learning texts, right? You read a bit, answer a question, and bam, instant feedback. Talk about a blast from the past. But um, format aside, it's amazing how relevant his insights still are. Oh, absolutely. For example, Bullock really hammers home that performance isn't just about doing the work. It's the results you get. Yeah. She sums it up with this, like, this really simple but powerful equation. Performance. Behavior accomplishment. So it's not enough to just go through the motions, right? Well, You've got to actually see those accomplishments, those tangible outcomes. Exactly. Like he uses a salesperson as an example. Their behavior might be making calls, attending meetings, giving presentations, all that. But their accomplishment, well, that's measured by the deals they close and the revenue they bring in. Exactly. And it's that distinction that's so important when you're trying to figure out, like, the root cause of a performance problem, right? Is it a behavior issue? Like, maybe they're not following the sales script correctly or something. Or is it an accomplishment problem? Meaning they're doing all the right things, but they're still not closing those deals. And that's where uh, Bullock's whole thing about worthwhile problems comes in. He argues that, you know, we should really focus on fixing the issues that really hit the organization's bottom line. Don't sweat the small stuff. Right, exactly. Because, I mean, why waste time and resources on something if it doesn't really move the needle? Exactly. Like, imagine a scenario, right, where you've got this sales team and they're stuck using this, like, ancient CRM system. Oh, I've been there. <laughs> so they end up spending hours every day just wrestling with this clunky software instead of you know, focusing on clients, building relationships. Yeah, that's a recipe for disaster, both for morale and revenue. Exactly. It's a lose-lose. And in a case like that, simply throwing more sales training at them isn't going to help. You've got to address that root problem, the CRM system. And that's why Bullock really emphasizes, you know, analyzing the situation, figure out what's really holding people back, and then choose the right solution, whether it's a job aid, training, or even something completely different. It's about finding the right tool for the job. And sometimes, as Bullock points out, the best solution isn't formal training at all. It's a well-designed job aid. Think checklists, flowcharts, reference guides, anything that gives people that just-in-time support so they don't have to rely on memory alone. It's true. I mean, think about how often you use a checklist for something important. All the time. Right. It could be something as, I don't know, as critical as a pre-flight checklist for a pilot, or even just, you know, a step-by-step -step guide for putting together IKEA furniture. Or even a grocery list so you don't forget the milk, which yeah. I do all and the time. I've all been there. But what I find so interesting is that Bullock actually provides this, like, this decision flowchart yeah. to help you decide, job aid or training. He loved his flowcharts. Oh, he did. He breaks everything down so systematically. Almost like he's, you know, anticipating how we might program decision-making into computers, oh. which is fascinating. Right. Like it gives you this peek into his brain, how he approached problems. And, and you know what else is really interesting? He actually has this whole concept of job training aids, which mm -hmm. are basically aids designed to teach people how to use the job aids. Whoa, that's very meta. It is. Like he's acknowledging that even the simplest tool sometimes needs an instruction manual. But of course, Bullock also recognizes that there are definitely times when training is the best way to go, especially when there's a performance gap because people lack certain skills or knowledge. Right, exactly. And that's where he makes this this critical distinction between what he calls traditional training and performance based training. OK, so what's the difference? Break it down for us. So traditional training, at least according to Bullock, often focuses mainly on just delivering information. Sort of like a lecture, right? Right. And while that can be fine for, you know, establishing some foundational knowledge, it doesn't always translate directly to, you know, actual on-the-job performance. It's like uh, it's like the difference between knowing about something and actually knowing how to do it. Like you could read every book in the world about riding a bike. Right. But until you actually get on one and try, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to magically develop the skill. Exactly. 
And that's where performance-based training comes in. It's all about having these clearly defined objectives, mm -hmm. measurable outcomes, and most importantly, practical application. He talks about uh, training for microcomputer salespeople, which even though the technology is, you know, a bit dated now, the point still stands. The training is built around the specific tasks and skills needed to succeed in that role. So instead of just lecturing about all the computer features, they're actually role playing, practicing sales pitches, probably even troubleshooting those common customer issues, you know, making it real, making yeah. it relevant. Exactly. And Bullock's point is that this approach isn't just for salespeople. It applies to any field. He's all about incorporating those hands on activities, simulations, role plays, case studies. Hmm. He wants to ditch those boring lectures, get people engaged and give them real opportunities to apply what they're learning. He sounds like a true advocate for active learning. Oh, absolutely. Way ahead of his time. And speaking of ahead of his time, he even touches on using computers in training, or as he called it, computer-based training. Wow. Even back then, he saw the potential of technology and training. That's incredible. It makes you wonder what he'd say about today's world, online courses, virtual simulations, all the learning tech we have at our fingertips now. Oh, I know, right? It's like he planted the seed for this whole digital learning revolution without even realizing it. It really is amazing to think about how far we've come. But, you know, even with his forward thinking ideas about technology, he always circles back to those core principles of, you know, good instructional design, clear objective, practical application, and that laser focus on real world performance. That's so true. And that really comes through in his discussion of how people actually learn and how to design training that works with those natural learning processes, yeah. not against them. Like he introduces this idea of response chains, which are basically these sequences of actions or decisions that when you put them all together, they make up a task. OK, so walk me through that. What do response chains have to do with like with actually designing effective training? Let's see. Um, think of it like learning how to bake a cake. OK, so you wouldn't just take all the ingredients and dump them all in a bowl at once, would you? Hopefully not. Right. There's a specific order you have to follow, a set of steps to get that delicious cake. So that's essentially a response chain. So you're saying that if you want to teach someone how to bake a cake effectively, you need to understand all those individual steps, the cues that tell you when to move from one step to the next, the things you want to avoid doing so you don't end up with a disaster. That's it. You've got it. And Bullock's argument is that fundamentally, that same principle applies to training for any job or task, no matter how complex. You analyze the task, break it down into those smaller steps, and then you can design the training to support people at each stage along the way. Like you're creating this roadmap for their learning journey. But he doesn't just leave it there, does he? He actually breaks down these response chains into different types. You're right. He does. He talks about like fixed or procedural response chains where, you know, the steps are always the same, kind of like following a recipe or operating a piece of machinery. There's one right way to do it. And then there are these flexible or variable chains where the order might change depending on the situation. So something like, I don't know, troubleshooting a technical issue would be a more flexible chain, right? Yeah. Because the steps you take to resolve it will depend on the specific problem you encounter. Exactly. And that distinction is important because Bullock suggests that the type of response chain can and really should influence how you design the training. So for those fixed chains, you might lean more heavily on job aids, checklists, things like that, or really structured practice. But when you're dealing with those more flexible chains, you might focus on developing those higher level skills like decision making, problem solving strategies, or even using simulations where people have to respond to those unexpected challenges. It makes intuitive sense, right? Tailor the training approach to the kind of task people will be doing in the real world. Now, Bullock also dives into these concepts of stimulus discrimination and stimulus generalization, which sound a little bit uh, intimidating. Can you give us a refresher on those? Sure. So stimulus discrimination is basically the ability to spot the difference between two things that might seem similar and then respond appropriately based on that difference. Imagine, for example, a cashier who needs to be able to tell if someone is trying to use counterfeit money. Oh, yeah. 
high stakes. Right. Or a doctor who's trying to diagnose an illness right. and they need to distinguish between very subtle symptoms. Okay. So it's about recognizing those unique features, those telltale signs, and then reacting in a very precise way. So then what about stimulus generalization? That's the flip side, right? Right. So the stimulus generalization is when you learn something in one context and then you're able to apply that knowledge or skill to a bunch of other situations that are similar. Yeah. It's like, you know, once you learn how to drive a car, Right. You can probably figure out how to drive a van without having to, like, completely start over. Right. You're transferring those skills to a different but related scenario. Exactly. And Bullock argues that both of these concepts are super important when it comes to designing training programs. So if your goal is that someone needs to follow a very specific procedure perfectly with zero room for error, well, then you're going to emphasize stimulus discrimination. But if the goal is that you want people to be more adaptable, to be able to take what they've learned and apply it to all kinds of new situations, well, then you'll want to encourage more stimulus generalization. So it's a balance, right? You've got to find that sweet spot between precision and flexibility, depending on what the job demands. But, you know, training isn't just about what's happening externally, right? There's mm -hmm. a whole internal world going on for each learner, their thoughts, their feelings, their memories. And Bullock recognizes that, too. 100%. He talks about how even if two people get the exact same information, they might respond in completely different ways just based on their own personal experiences, how they're feeling that day, what motivates them. Human behavior is complex. It really is. And you can't just ignore that complexity. You can't treat learners like they're just robots downloading information. Exactly. And this is where his point about conceptual behavior comes in. Yeah. It's our ability to look at something and understand not just what it looks like, but what it means, the deeper significance. He uses a chessboard as an example, which I always love. Oh, that's a good one. To someone who's never played chess, it's just, you know, a bunch of black and white squares. Right. But to someone who knows the game, it's like each square represents all these possibilities. Oh, yeah. Potential moves. Strategic advantages. Right. And that understanding, that deeper level of meaning, it changes everything about how you interact with the board, the decisions you make. Exactly. And... Bullock's point is that for a lot of jobs, especially those knowledge-based roles, success hinges on that ability to think conceptually, to connect the dots, to grasp those underlying meanings and relationships. It's about understanding the why behind the what, not just memorizing a bunch of facts. Exactly. And Bullock argues that this has huge implications for how we design and deliver training. When it's about conceptual understanding, you can't just throw facts and figures at people and expect them to get it. You need to help them make those connections to understand why something is important, how it all fits together within the bigger picture. Yeah. It's about fostering that that deeper level of understanding, not just rote memorization. Yeah. And I love that he actually gives you these concrete strategies for doing that. He has that great table in his book. It's like a cheat sheet for trainers that outlines all these different training methods and when each one is going to be most effective. Oh, yeah. That's a good one. Mm. Want to teach someone to follow a step-by-step -step procedure? Use a job aid or a live demonstration. Need them to be able to tell the difference between two similar concepts. Present examples and not examples. It's about understanding how people learn best and then, mm -hmm. you know, designing the training accordingly. And of course, Bullock was not a fan of those lecture heavy training sessions. Oh, definitely not. He calls it the default approach, but but not necessarily the most effective. Right. I think we've all been in those lectures where your eyes just start to glaze <laughs> over and mm -hmm. totally. It's just not how most people learn best. He was all about active learning simulations, role plays, case studies, anything to get people involved, get them applying what they're learning. And don't forget his emphasis on feedback, too. Oh, yes. Constant feedback. Not a one time thing. He sees it as absolutely critical for motivation and for making sure people are on the right track. He even distinguishes between corrective feedback, which is all about identifying and fixing those errors, and motivational feedback, which is about reinforcing positive behavior and encouraging people to keep going. It's like having a good coach in your corner. They'll point out where you can improve, but they'll also celebrate your successes and cheer you on. But even with the best training design in the world, Bullock acknowledges that training alone can't magically solve every performance problem. He's refreshingly honest about that, that training has its limits. Right, exactly. He reminds us that sometimes the root cause of a performance issue isn't the person at all, it's the environment they're in. Interesting. Things like, oh, I don't know, lack of motivation, terrible working conditions, unclear expectations. Maybe they're just not getting the support they need from their manager. It's like trying to grow a plant in bad soil. 
You can give it all the water and sunlight you want, but if the soil is no good, it's not going to thrive. A perfect analogy. And this is where his concept of the performance environment comes in. He encourages trainers to zoom out and look at all the factors that play a role in how well people do their jobs. It's not just about skills and knowledge. It's also about incentives, the resources people have available, how clearly information is communicated, the feedback mechanisms that are in place. Is this a supportive environment? Is it demotivating? you got to factor all of that in. You're looking at the whole system. Exactly. And he even challenges trainers to examine their own behavior and how it might be influencing that environment too. Are you providing enough support? Are you setting clear expectations? Are you recognizing and rewarding good work? It's a good reminder that trainers are part of that ecosystem too. Absolutely. Their actions, their attitudes, their leadership, it all matters. And and this focus on the bigger picture extends to his ideas about individual learner needs too, right? Like he, he talks about how crucial it is to figure out what a learner already knows and can do before you just launch into a training program. Right. He stresses that you don't want to waste time teaching people what they already know, which seems obvious. but yeah. But it happens. It does. And he even goes so far as to include remedial training as this necessary component in his uh, idealized training unit. Interesting. He recognized that, you know, sometimes people might need a little extra support to grasp certain things. He wasn't afraid to differentiate that learning experience to meet those different needs. And it's all right there in his diagram of the idealized training unit, too. He has people going down different learning paths based on how they perform on pre-tests and post-tests. It's like he had this premonition of, you know, personalized learning paths and adaptive learning technologies that we use today. It really is like he was way ahead of his time anticipating these things. But at the end of the day, it all comes back to that core principle. Training should be tailored to the individual learner and driven by those desired performance outcomes. Now, I'm curious, how do you think his ideas, especially this emphasis on performance based training, how do they apply to today's workplace? especially with so many people working remotely now? It's a great question. And honestly, I think those core principles of performance-based training, you know, clear objectives, practical application, focusing on those measurable outcomes, I think they're more relevant now than ever, even in these remote and hybrid work environments. I think so too. But we've got to be willing to adapt the delivery methods. Absolutely. So instead of those in-person simulations we were talking about, maybe you're using virtual role-playing or online branching scenarios, Right. And how do you create that sense of community and connection when everyone's remote? Maybe you incorporate those virtual breakout rooms or mm -hmm. peer coaching or online discussion forums, anything to keep people engaged and connected. Exactly. And even his decision flowchart for choosing between job aids and training, we'd have to rethink that a bit for the digital age, too. Like, how easy is it to create and share those digital job aids? Right. Can people access them easily on their own devices, integrated right into their workflow? And how do you make those digital aids engaging? You don't want them to just be these walls of text that people tune out. You know, I'm realizing as we're talking that so much of what makes Bullock's work so enduring is that those core principles that focus on performance, analysis, practical application, those are timeless. It's just the specific methods and the tools we use that need to change as the world changes. That's such a good point. And I think it really speaks to Bullock's ability to see beyond the trends of his time, to tap into something really fundamental about how we learn, how we perform, how we improve. Which is why, you know, even though this book was written decades ago, it still speaks to us. It's not just some dusty relic of the past. There's real practical guidance here, and it's honestly pretty inspiring. Now let's shift gears for a moment and talk about another area where Bullock's insights are still so relevant, his perspective on the role of the training consultant. He has this whole section about educating your clients, which I found so insightful. It's such a good point. He realized that training professionals need to be more than just instructors. They need to be those strategic advisors, those consultants who understand the business and can really advocate for their work. It's about building those relationships, speaking the language of business, right? Yeah. Showing them how training can actually move the needle on those big organizational goals. Exactly. Because he recognized that, unfortunately, a lot of training departments, they get stuck in this rut of being seen as just an expense, you know, not a strategic investment. Right. And that can lead to this unhealthy focus on like just cutting costs instead of, you know, trying to maximize the impact of the training. It becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy, right? It is. It is. And that's why he talks about, you know, educating your clients. He's talking about this process of helping all those stakeholders, those decision makers, see the value in what you do. 
<laughs> how training can actually contribute to that bottom line they care so much about. And he's got some pretty specific advice on how to do that, too. It's not just these vague suggestions. He actually gives examples of, like, how to build stronger relationships with managers, really understand their business needs, and then connect the dots for them, show them how training is the answer to their problems. Yeah, exactly. He talks about, uh, I think his name is Barry Booth at Caterpillar. Oh, yeah, great story. Who basically challenged everyone to really articulate the why behind every training request. Like, make sure you can draw a direct line back to a real business need. Because otherwise, why are we even here? Exactly. So it's about shifting that whole conversation from, hey, we need training, to here's how training is going to help us achieve X, Y, and Z. And you've got to be able to back it up with data. Be results-oriented. Speak their language. I love that. Right. And he also cautions trainers about becoming just order takers, you know, mm. just churning out program after program without ever stopping to ask if it's actually what the organization needs. It's about being more than just an instructor. You're a consultant, a trusted <laughs> advisor. And sometimes that means pushing back a little, questioning those assumptions, and advocating for what you know is going to be most effective. He wanted training professionals to be true professionals. I love that. And that commitment comes through in, in everything, really. Like, even his emphasis on continuous learning. He really believed that Trainers need to stay current in their field, read all the latest research, go to conferences, talk to each other, keep learning. And he didn't just talk the talk, he walked the walk. Mm -hmm. I mean, even in this book, oh, I know. he's referencing studies, quoting other experts. You can tell that he's constantly pushing himself to learn and grow. He really embodies that growth mindset, and, and it speaks to how much he valued knowledge. It's not just a commodity, something you just hand off to someone else. Yeah. It's like this engine for continuous improvement. And that's something we can all aspire to no matter what our role is or what industry we're in. So as you dig into Bullock's work, and I highly recommend reading the source material if you haven't already think about this, how can we apply these principles of educating our clients in today's world? How can we help leaders see themselves as part of that learning ecosystem, not just, you know, the people signing off on the budget? It's about creating that culture of continuous learning and development. Yes, yeah, that's what it's all about. And on that note, We'll wrap up this deep dive into Donald H. Bullock's The Training Consultants Memo. A huge thank you to our expert for joining us and for this amazing conversation. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. And thank you for listening. We'll be back next time with another deep dive into the world of training and performance improvement. Until then, keep learning and keep those performance goals in sight.